Good afternoon, Nancy. It is such a privilege, a, a very great honor, in fact, to be sitting down with you today. And um, you are a very beloved and admired teacher, and certainly thinker in our field, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing your stories. So let's start at the very beginning. I would really like to hear about any part, whatever part of your childhood, background, early years as you're comfortable sharing. When I encounter principled people, I want to know how they came to be that way. I just have to start by saying that I am so honored to be interviewed and um, to have it part of the Primer Archive. What Primer has done for our field is remarkable, and you have singularly made that happen, and I just need to start by saying that. Um, so let's see. My uh, childhood uh, happened fairly close to where we're sitting right now. I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts. Um, in a really lovely uh, neighborhood of socially and academically minded people. Um, I started out with a mom and a dad and two older brothers. And um, my father uh, was a first generation American. His um, parents were Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. And um, he had a sort of rags to riches kind of story. And I guess part of what marked my childhood was great attention to never wasting a penny and being reprimanded if lights were left on or celery leaves were thrown out instead of being put in the soup. Um, and also the importance of learning. We were kids who didn't do sports. We were kids who were told how important learning was. Um, and uh, my mother, who was a stay-at-home mom, um, came out of a tradition of social justice. And she wasn't an activist. It was just part of what she uh, taught us to always stand up for the right things. I was um, born in 1960, and so I watched my older brother go through a lot of uh, riots and things related to civil rights. And um, we were just taught about it was it was just part of it was it was part of the fabric. Um, I, I would not say my family was politically active by any stretch of the ma imagination, um, but it was part of the fabric uh, to do the right thing, stand up for what's right, um, and do well in school. I would say. And then um, when I was twelve, my mom died, and um, when I was fifteen, my dad remarried another absolutely wonderful woman with a different kind of background um, who my brothers have um, come to label as our second mother. Stepmother always has a very strange connotation. Who brought with her five more siblings for me. And um, we now have a really large family that's mostly based in Boston. So that's my childhood story. And having heard that learning and education were paramount and clearly core values, I'd like to hear about your educational odyssey. So um, I applied to a lot of colleges at a time when I don't think as many kids did. Um, I really did not have a lot of confidence about where I would get in. Um, I also had a piece of my life, particularly at the time, that was um, uh, focused on music. I did a lot of music in high school, and so I had also applied to a conservatory. Um, but I ended up uh, going to Stanford. I sort of took the deep, uh, what felt to me, scary decision to go far away. In the end, I was deciding between going far away or staying close to home, and I decided to go far away and um, loved it. Stanford was a um, different environment, but it was a great school for me. And one of the things that it allowed me to do academically was major in a program that at the time was pretty new and has become one of their largest and most popular programs called Human Biology, which really was, um, its main selling point was that it was both interdisciplinary and focused on public policy. So all the students in it had to take a core year of um, 
natural science biology, but all focused on humans, not on plant biology, and a um, core set of courses, essentially, in social science, and the two were brought together in an integrated way. They referred to each other, um, and then students designed their own concentration that included five courses, and you had to have a public policy course. My self-designed concentration was Again, it's so funny thinking back, because at the time I felt like I had no clue what I wanted to do with my life. But in retrospect, um, I designed something called a feminist approach to public health um, and took feminist theory and human physiology and a health policy class. Um, and that's what I did um, at Stanford. Uh, and then I spent two years working at a little women's health clinic nonprofit, um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. and decided after two years that I wanted to apply to graduate school in public health. And that's what brought me to Johns Hopkins, which turned out, in retrospect, to be a great decision because I have, give or take, been there ever since. Um, I started there in 1985 and started um, actually in a master's program in health policy, but after about uh, one semester, my advisor at the time convinced me to switch to the doctoral program, which I did, and I was happy about. Um, and then after uh, Hopkins, when I had become more interested in ethics, did a um, two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics, um, and then uh, came back to Hopkins to be on the faculty. I put together and was approved for my self-designed concentration at Stanford was a medical ethics class, and undergrads were allowed to take the medical ethics class at the Stanford Medical School. So I had taken a medical ethics class, and for some reason that um, about which I have zero recollection in college, had been attracted to that class. Um, but then it didn't uh, really cross my mind to think about ethics again for a few years. In my first year of graduate school at Johns Hopkins, one of the courses that I took, which was an elective class, was the public health ethics class that Ruth Faden um, taught, developed. It was probably the first, one of the first, if not the first, public health ethics course ever developed in this country. And I loved the class. I fell in love with the topic. I fell in love with Ruth. I um, really came to think this was something I wanted to do more of. Um, and then at the end of my first year of graduate school, I had a job and then I went home for a while. Um, and before returning for my second year of graduate school, um, had what I look back on and call this very short, it probably lasted about a week, but felt very traumatic existential crisis about whether I really did want to be in public health graduate school, um, and thought for a very brief amount of time that I wanted to be a clinical psychologist and work with people. At the Women's Health Clinic, where I'd worked for two years, I was doing a lot of counseling and had loved that. Um, and the person I decided I wanted to go back and talk to was Ruth Faden, um, who again had been a professor in one class. Um, and I knocked on her door, and she um, told me that uh, if I wanted to counsel people one-on-one, -on -one, it did make sense to be a clinical psychologist. But if what I wanted to do was work with people, which ultimately was what I really did want to do, um, her career had been very collaborative. And um, she felt like she worked with people all the time. And that was enough to convince me. But what I also said during that meeting was, is there anything I can do to work with you? I'll volunteer. I don't need to be paid. I just want to work with you. And she was writing a chapter at the time and said, sure, you could help me with the lit review. And I did that. And then I ended up working more on that chapter and then on various other uh, projects with her. She then developed a second class in ethics. Um, again, interesting looking back, as this was the mid-1980s, but a class on um, justice and health policy, which has since become really one of the key foci of her, one of the many areas of her life work. Um, she's now working on her second remarkable book in that area. 
Um, and then uh, shortly after that, I switched so that she became my PhD advisor. So that was my journey into ethics. And at the time, Johns Hopkins didn't have any kind of formal um, doctoral program or focus on ethics. But there were a couple of us who became interested um, in ethics. Gail Geller was um, in graduate school with me and also developed this interest in ethics. And in, um, a, a program was developed uh, within our then Department of Health Policy and Management um, in law, ethics, and health. And so our doctoral studies were, uh, I guess, sort of informally part of that program. You referred to the period of time when Ruth was asked to chair the advisory committee on radiation safety. And since these are self-contained oral histories, even though we're going to talk to Ruth about that as well, I'd love you to summarize what the charge was, what the um, scope was, and what your role was in that very important work. Hazel O'Leary was Secretary of Energy at the time under President Clinton. And she had been at a press conference when a reporter in the Southwest uh, asked Secretary O'Leary <clears throat> about some experiments that this reporter had heard about where Americans during the Cold War period from the 1940s uh, to the uh, 40s and for the few decades beyond, um, had been intentionally exposed to radiation as part of our Cold War effort, basically, to see what the effects of radiation were. And Secretary O'Leary said, with honesty, essentially, I've never heard of this. I don't know if this is true. But if it is true, we will look into this. And it turned out it was true. And it turned out that as they started to look into this, they realized that there was a Pandora's box, that there was an enormous amount of classified information related to these experiments that our government had done on our citizens without the citizens knowing. A variety of kinds of experiments, some were broad intentional exposures in the environment, some were things like irradiating the milk of children at the Fernald School, which is a few miles from here, um, developmentally disabled children to see what the effect of radiation is on the human system. And um, the Department of Energy decided they needed an independent committee to look into this, to go through these classified documents, which were made unclassified for the first time. And um, what turned out to be to hire um, many, many historians to essentially do historical work to try to understand what was going on and what the context was. Um, much of the work of this advisory committee on human radiation experiments, which Ruth Faden was asked to chair, um, was uh, retrospective in nature. Their job primarily was to look to see what had happened, what radiation experiments our government had conducted, and ultimately what, if anything, was owed to the American people as a result of that. At the same time, Ruth and I think um, the other members of the commission recognized that the more the public in the 1990s when this work was unfolding became aware of what had happened at the hands of our government to its citizens, the more they would want to know whether research today was actually safe or not. The advisory committee decided, I think quite wisely, to do three different prospective studies to try to understand what is going on in research and research ethics today, essentially, in 1994, 1995. Um, and um, I was hired to help with one of those three projects. It was a project called the Subject Interview Study. Um, I did it closely with my dear friend and colleague, Jeremy Sugarman. Um, and the project had two components, a large quantitative component, which Jeremy primarily led, and a large qualitative one, which I um, headed up, although, again, Jeremy and I worked very collaboratively on the whole thing. Um, we did surveys in um, 16 hospitals across the United States, public and private hospitals from different regions, to interview patients, 
who were either in cancer or cardi cardiology waiting rooms to ask them their attitudes about research and then to find out if they believed they had ever been in research and then we asked their permission to look at medical records to see if they had been in research. Um, and uh, one thing that turned out to be true that was um, an important finding was that people did have very positive views of research. And then we asked people who reported that they had been part of research if they were willing to take part in a longer qualitative interview. So we conducted essentially 100 interviews with people who had been part of research. And those findings ended up taking me, and I think Jeremy would probably say the same um, himself, um, in some new directions in research ethics. Because what we heard as people like Chuck Litz and, and Paul Applebaum had documented not too long before was that these people who again were either cancer or, cancer or cardiology patients who had been in research spoke of research as if it were their treatment and often spoke of it as if it were the one thing that was likely to cure them or save them or allow for a miraculous discovery. There's none of that that necessarily is untrue. Their, their being in research might have been the thing that saved them, improved their lives, uh, turned everything around. Um, but we had enough quotes that spoke to what people not only hoped for, but in our minds expected might happen in research, that we um, wanted to study that more. So that was the work for the Radiation Committee. And for me, it was a great experience. It got me. Um, it, it was really the first very large-scale project I did in research ethics. But the next NIH grant I wrote, and it uh, was collaboratively again with Jeremy, um, was to look at informed consent in the phase one cancer setting. And it was a chance to look to see what people who are very sick and, and entering a kind of clinical trial that is really only offered to people who don't have good treatment op options um, were thinking about uh, research. And anyway, it led me more to that path. Comment that I've heard, however sporadically through the years, that that anyone, quote, anyone who thinks that a terminally ill person can give truly informed consent should not have the privilege of conducting research because that's a per se vulnerability and a perhaps irrebuttable one. What's your opinion about that, having done this kind of research? That's a really interesting comment. I guess I find that comment a little troubling. Um, I. You and I both, most people, have known a lot of people who uh, are very ill, and we've interacted with them when they're very ill. And I would never say that, I mean, so there's, there's a bracketing when a disease goes to someone's brain and they truly lose capacity. But before then, I would never say that someone has lost the capacity to make reasonable, rational judgments. I appreciate the sentiment behind that, that being very seriously ill, and maybe particularly for people where it comes out of nowhere, where, they're, where the illness comes at what's sort of considered a premature age, can lead people to make fairly desperate decisions. Um, and can lead people to overestimate the likelihood of benefit from things where the actual chances are extremely small. So I think that is true. Um, but I would never say that consent discussion should not be had. I, I, would, I would shudder to think that somebody might ever suggest that you always need a surrogate there or something like that. Again, the, the breadth as well as the depth of your scholarship has been staggering and clearly profoundly influential. And I would love your help in guiding me through this remarkable landscape. I know that 
you have been very involved near the early or in the early years of the pandemic of HIV AIDS in studying HIV AIDS and I'd like to hear something about the genesis of that work and the nature of that work. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, as I said earlier, I came to Johns Hopkins in 1985, and I moved to Johns Hopkins from Northern California. So I was living in Northern California when HIV hit. And in Northern California, it hit big. And um, I knew a lot of people who were uh, either truly personally affected by um, what came to be known as HIV, um, or who were sort of working for the cause. Um, in San Francisco at the time, it really felt like our equivalent to the civil rights movement. It was um, HIV uh, at the time was really thought of as a gay disease. It was only a few years later that it was also recognized to be prominent in people who were using injection drugs. And in the 80s, it was just thought of as a gay disease. And gay people were dying, and nobody knew why. And again, in the early 80s, there wasn't even a test yet. The virus hadn't been identified. Um, and when I moved to Johns Hopkins for graduate school, I took all the public health and research and health services and health policy classes that everybody else took and loved them. Um, but when I wanted to get my first part-time job, which later evolved into, two years later, the same study with which I did my um, doctoral dissertation research, I very deliberately wanted to work on an HIV AIDS research study. And I had the remarkable good fortune um, to work for what was called the SHARE study, um, the study to help the AIDS research effort, which was the Baltimore site of a four-site multi-center study called the Multi-Center AIDS Cohort Study, the MAC study, which was really one of the first large large HIV cohort studies that was funded by the NIH. Um, Frank Polk, who is unfortunately uh, no longer alive, led the uh, Baltimore site. Um, and I will say that in those days, in the 80s, HIV felt like a um, hybrid of a public health problem and a political movement. And I gravitated toward both of those pieces. I became um, very involved for years in a um, nonprofit volunteer effort in Baltimore called the AIDS Legislative Committee. It wasn't affiliated with Johns Hopkins, but um, many of us, most of whom had professional backgrounds, a lot of lawyers and doctors and social workers um, came together once a week on Thursdays from 7 to 10 and uh, looked to see what was going to be happening in the Maryland legislature. And in those days, there were horrible things. There were toe tag bills. There were people wanting to HIV test every possible population. Um, and our job was to anticipate legislation, write legislation, do grassroots mailing campaign and try to raise $10,000 for a part-time lobbyist. And we did that for years. And HIV was just a big focus of my life. So it made, it was very natural for me that um, it would be the focus of my dissertation. And it was the focus of my research for easily the first five years I was um, on the faculty. Um, my dissertation was on access to health insurance for gay and bisexual men. And I interviewed about uh, you would think I would remember, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 um, gay men to find out what their access to health insurance had been and some questions about discrimination. And there was really a sense, which I think is true in so many political movements that, um, and maybe particularly in a small state like Maryland, that um, individual efforts can make a difference. And there were remarkable grassroots and nonprofit efforts going on all over Baltimore the way I'm sure there were in other places. I was so far from alone. I mean, there, there were so many other people who were beginning to do HIV work at Johns Hopkins who had exactly the same sympathies and sentiments and commitments. And um, again, it really felt like a political movement to try to get research done as fast as possible. So.
any observations you had about the difference in levels of stigmatization or, or results of stigmatization between your time in Northern California and the San Francisco Bay Area and your time in Hopkins? Again, you did just say that there was a huge mobilized community working hard and fast in Baltimore, but did you notice any perceptible difference because of the concentration of being yeah. in the Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, I don't remember that. I mean, there's, there's nothing like the Castro in Baltimore. Um, but I also wouldn't say that that Baltimore was a bad place to live as a as a um, gay person. I mean, it's I I wasn't a gay man then. I, I can't speak to that. So in certain ways, maybe it's not my perception that matters. But but part of the HIV/AIDS narrative and it's documented so well in. Randy Schultz's book and the band played on, and so many other um, stories, uh, reports of that time, was the experience in so many parts of the country of the horrible and violent discrimination against mostly gay and bisexual men, I, um, gay people generally, but particularly the gay and bisexual men. Um, and it was so intertwined with hatred around HIV. So the two became um, almost synonymous. It was one of the reasons why I was curious in my doctoral work, the degree to, we sim the d degree to which simply being gay was became a, a source of discrimination in something like health insurance. Um, but we were all very aware of the stories of people who would go home to die, and that would sometimes be in rural North Carolina or Texas or a place where um, their family wouldn't tell anybody why the son was moving home. And, and sometimes the family would, and great things would happen. But So I would say that was very much part of the narrative of the country and the story. I don't remember feeling it um, in Baltimore. Again, going back for just another moment, you mentioned that while at Stanford your interest had been in women's health. And um, even though that might not have directly borne on your work in bioethics or research ethics in particular, I'd love to hear about that period, however briefly. Sure. Um, so when I was an undergraduate, uh, I, at some point, and I can't remember exactly when, um, decided I wanted to volunteer in a women's health clinic. And I started volunteering in two places. I volunteered at my local Planned Parenthood. Um, one morning a week. And I also started to volunteer at something called the Women's Needs Center, which was the women's health part of something called the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinics, which um, were a series of, as the name would suggest, free clinics in San Francisco. Um, and uh, did that for probably my last year or two of college. And then um, after graduating from college when I um, then had a job in a different women's health clinic, continued to, uh, part of my job negotiation was that I still wanted to have a day a week when I could go up to San Francisco to this Haight-Ashbury Free Women's Clinic, which I just loved, um, and do things there, and that was great. So um, I had no skills. I wasn't a clinician. I couldn't, I had no license in anything, so I couldn't do honest to goodness health care provision, obviously. Um, but I did what was so prevalent at women's clinics then, and I don't know, I'm embarrassed to say maybe still happens now, but maybe doesn't, which uh, was I was a counselor. And we were allowed to be called counselors without any kind of skills or training beyond what the clinic gave us. And so both at the free clinic and at um, the clinic where I ended up having a job for two years, uh, we would be the first point of contact when women, the people who, the patients who came, um, came in. And we would sit down with them and take notes about why they were there. And we were trained to provide basic information, health education about birth control, about abortion, about um, a few other kinds of health, but honestly, it was much more reproductive health. Um, 
and we would give them counseling about different kinds of birth control alternatives. Uh, and then they would go in and see the nurse practitioner, and it was almost always the nurse practitioner. Um, and uh, and I loved that. And then at the, that was basically the job I had at the um, women's health clinic where I had a job for two years, although I was, by the time, right before I left for graduate school, for the last six months or so, I was promoted to be in charge of the front office staff, um, which has nothing to do uh, with women's health per se or anything I went into. But um, it, I actually loved it. It was a chance to, um, well, I, in the kind of thing that you, Joan Racklin, would appreciate, it was a very fun opportunity to um, interact with people who had very administrative positions and try to uh, change the morale and figure out a way to uh, have people feel valued and uh, um, want to stay there for a long time. So it was actually, it was actually a piece of the job that I uh, loved doing. Um, so. A quick follow-up, and then we will move on. Uh, one of the earliest, certainly, and, and also one of the most enduring questions in ethics, bioethics, is when does life begin? And did those early years of women's health get you thinking about that? Was it explicit, implicit? Was that any part of your odyssey toward a bioethics? Group? No, it's a great question. I honestly feel like the answer is no. Now, it may be because, um, and, and in certain ways, I was sort of genetically programmed to uh, think this way. I, um, I was brought up in a politically liberal and progressive family. Honestly, everybody I knew in my neighborhood was pro-choice, and we were all given as the Bible, the, our bodies, ourselves. And it was, um, uh, it seemed like the mission was to uh, ensure that people got the health care that they wanted and needed. So for me, the um, the link to bioethics was not so much the when does life begin, although I totally get it that that would be the intellectual path that would resonate for some people. For me, it was more the kind of thing that everybody talks about in um, healthcare and certainly public health that I might put an ethics spin on, but one doesn't need to, um, which is all people, whether or not they have money, should have access to health care. They should have somebody sitting down with them and respectfully looking them in the eye and asking them what's going on with them and what they need. Um, and that, to me, links squarely with bioethics and the commitments of everyday bioethics and all of those cliched terms. Um, so it was, and in certain ways, it probably then makes sense that what I wanted to go into was public health, um, because those, to me, are also core commitments of public health. My own entry into international research ethics, and it really was international research ethics, um, in the late 1990s, at the time felt to me like um, a Johnny-come-lately. Mind you, there were very few people in bioethics doing international work, but Ruth Macklin was, and I felt like that had been a core piece of her work for as long as I had known her. Um, and that wasn't true for me. Again, I started doing HIV policy ethics work. Um, but in the late 1990s, um, as some of us will recall, uh, there was this enormous bioethics and research controversy about perinatal HIV trials that were being conducted in um, low-resource countries around the world uh, to test the efficacy of a short course of AZT to prevent um, babies from being HIV infected whose uh, mothers were HIV infected. And this was building on some extraordinarily successful clinical trials that had happened in the United States and France that showed that if you gave a pregnant woman who was HIV infected 
AZT and her pregnancy and during labor and delivery and to her baby after birth, you could, you could uh, lessen the chance that her baby would be um, infected almost fourfold. And the standard of care changed immediately in the United States that all uh, women who were known to be HIV infected during pregnancy were given this AZT regimen. Um, because at the time the regimen was both very long and complicated, it was delivered over about eight months total, six during pregnancy and two afterwards. It assumed that deliveries were in the hospital and the, there were IVs available for the babies and it was very expensive, all these things. Um, it was quite clear that that wasn't going to become the standard of care in resource poor countries at least anytime soon. And so a lot of trials were started building on um, the concept that some amount of AZT maybe could prevent transmission, such that uh, 16 trials were coordinated around the world that were testing different kinds of regimens like three or four weeks of AZT to the pregnant woman um, at the end of her pregnancy against a placebo to see what the outcome would be. And this was as the result of a big consensus conference in um, Geneva where people from resource poor countries said we need an answer, we need something that makes sense for our people and it ought to be a lot of short course kinds of trials and they ought to be placebo controlled. So that's what happened. A, a year or two into these uh, trials actually going out into the field, um, Public Citizen, a very important nonprofit advocacy group in Washington, um, held a press release and followed it with um, a very, what turned out to be visible editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine saying that all of these studies were unethical, they created a double standard, um, and that uh, placebo-controlled trials shouldn't be done in poor countries if we wouldn't do them in the United States. And this became um, an enormous controversy that I would say in 2013 has still not been resolved. But um, having been involved with HIV research at Hopkins and having developed, although I think this is part of what I love about Johns Hopkins, collaborative relationships with so many other people, and I really think that's the culture that exists at Johns Hopkins. Um, people came together to say, what should we do? And it's not only, it was not only what's the right answer, but as an example, our same dean I spoke of earlier, Al Somer, um, said, we're an educational institution. We need to have a big forum on this. and. Um, at his uh, instigation, there was a forum. Sid Wolf from Public Citizen came in, um, and uh, a few other people on the panel. There were close to a thousand people who attended, um, and I was one of the people who spoke there. And uh, it was really to try to understand what are the ethical values at stake when people think it's appropriate to have a placebo-controlled trial and what are the ethical values at stake when people think that it's not appropriate. And I was really there to try to um, paint both sides of the debate through an ethics lens and a very close colleague of mine, Steve Goodman, did the same from a sort of study design epidemiology statistics lens. Subsequent to that big session, it seemed like there was an imperative to try to understand international research ethics more and try to understand how are the issues the same as we've been thinking about them in the United States when we've thought about research ethics and how are they different and how, and to the extent to which they're different, is it because these countries have less money? Is it because of different cultural norms? What's going on if we even say things are different? Um, and as so many of us commented during these very heated debates about the AZT trials, um, we, and again, so many other people commented that most of the debates were going on between Americans. And so we started to apply for grants to try to um, both do some amount of case study development in resource poor countries around research, but most importantly to try to get money to develop training so that people um, from Africa, which became our focus, uh, could be fluent enough in uh, the ethics piece of all of these conversations that they could be their own voice and wouldn't rely on um, Harold Varmus and Peter Lurie to 
duke it out. Um, so we uh, ended up in a very short period of time getting three different grants from the NIH that looked at international research ethics, and that just sort of um, became a larger focus of what we do, what I do. There was a raging debate that rages still. Um, the shorthand is moral relativism versus ethical imperialism. And I would love to hear the, again, the sort of nutshell version of your sense or take. I know it's not a monolithic response, but I still can't resist that. <laughs> so where do I fall down on that debate? Um, well, I'm probably going to frustrate you by starting to say it's not a monolithic response. And I, um, part of what I think so you know this as well as I, but part of what makes ethics so hard and part of the reason why people like us who've been thinking about research ethics for at least 20 years keep struggling over some uh, tough decisions is because the context really matters and the facts really matter. And I would never in a million years say I'm someone who's sort of pro-placebo or anti-placebo in these kinds of standard of care debates. Never. And what, um, to me, the values are universal, right? We want to um, thread the needle through such delicate territory of trying to achieve the most benefit while being respectful and not harming people. And I'm going to come down sometimes saying that a placebo controlled trial, when therapies exist in wealthy countries, is fine. And there will be other situations I look at and say, it's ridiculous. We never can. Um, so I'm different than some colleagues in that I am I will find some situations where I say it's fine. And there are other people who won't. Part of that is I do have a, a piece of me that has always been what I will call very practical. Part of what goes along with that have to be certain kinds of commitments that this kind of intervention would be then available to these people. So part of the argument for doing a placebo-controlled trial is that you get an answer faster, which you do, and you have the answer more conclusively, which you do. And those are only relevant considerations if the people who need the drugs are going to get them. So for me, bringing that in feels relevant, but then I'm open to having that discussion about the placebo. The two areas I'd like to quickly cover in the time we have remaining. The first is your work in informed consent, which in many people's minds is the rubber meets the road relationship in the research and certainly the ethical research context. And so you've done some very important work. I know um, it's included people with HIV AIDS. And I'd like to sh you to share with us your sense about some best practices, again, very wide and perhaps hard to um, address in a compressed fashion. But I'd like to hear the, yeah. about the work you've done and about the conclusions you've drawn yeah. as a scholar. Um, so I've done different kinds. So so I guess I, I, I'll give two quick comments as, as preface. One is um, the kind of work I do combines empirical approaches with sort of normative and conceptual. It's part of what our Berman Institute does. It's, um, again, for me, it combines what feels to me to be a very practical approach with thinking about ethics and values, which I love. So, um, uh, so that first NIH study that I mentioned before that um, we did after the advisory committee work was to develop what at the time in the 1990s felt like this very cool technology um, where we got money to develop a multimedia tool as an intervention. And it had, we spent tons of money buying touch screens, which at the time were not the norm, um, so that the patients who saw this multimedia intervention, which described to them what clinical trials were and what early phase clinical trials were, could then touch little embedded videos of patients who had decided to join trials and who decided not to, and oncologists who were describing them. So on the one hand, we, we did develop this sort of very cool thing, and it showed some positive effect. But to cut to the chase, I, and, 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 and I, I have done other kinds of work that have interviewed people both to see what they understand and about research, um, and to s start to look at some interventions that might help improve understanding in some different settings. I guess what I come down to, and it 
seems so silly, but it, I really am convinced of it, is that what makes more difference than anything is to have a conversation. And um, the large literature reviews that other people are doing seem to um, underscore this, that of all the fancy and simple interventions that people have created and tested experimentally related to informed consent, what I really am convinced make the most difference um, are the ones that involve conversation. Um, and that partly means it's good to tell people what the study's about and not just show it to them on a piece of paper, but also to engage them in conversation. And that can be through questions. It can be through narratives. There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, but I think um, I have often said to people, uh, if you do one thing in informed consent, find maybe three questions that you can ask. they are questions like, I've just given you a lot of information. Would you mind telling me in your own words what you think this study is about? And then you shut up and you listen. And that is the moment when either they say, oh boy, you know what? This has been an overwhelming morning. I have to admit I didn't hear a word you said. Or they heard a lot of the words you said, um, but they got a few pieces that are pretty important wrong. Like they say, you're going to give me a new asthma drug as opposed to an experimental one, or as opposed to half of us get the placebo. Um, anyway, I, and, and so I, I think there are uh, questions like, can you tell me in your own words what you think it's about? If it's a randomized study, does everybody get the same thing? Um, what would happen if you said no? If you feel like you, you can throw in what are the good things and bad things, but I would even do OK without that. Um, but it requires taking the time to listen. But I really think that, OK, we could teach that to people in about 15 seconds. Um, and I think it makes a difference. You are a great mentor, as well as a great teacher, thinker, writer, and scholar in general. What advice would you give to one of your mentees who asked you why you chose the bioethics field, what you've gotten from it, and what advice you'd have for them? I think I chose it because I liked it. I think I chose it because I was interested in it. Um, and it probably helped that the other people who were doing it at my institution were incredibly wonderful people I enjoyed hanging out with. So uh, those are those probably capture the kinds of general advice I give to all the people I mentor, and I assume everyone else does too, which is do something you're really interested in and do it with people you love to hang out with. Because we all spend many hours a day at work. And if you aren't interested in it and you don't like the people you're hanging out with, you're spending a lot of hours unhappy. And you know, this is in the context of people like us who have the luxury to make those kinds of choices. But um, those, those are pretty consistent messages. I. Thank you so much, Nancy, for sitting down with me today for the conversation, for the education always, and mostly for the inspiration. We are so fortunate that you are in our Primer family, and I'm very grateful for your time today. Thank you. Well, you are so welcome. And I just want to repeat what I said at the beginning, which is Primer has really um, been a gift to our community. And you've done tremendous work and service in making it a nurturing, humane place to have tough conversations. Mm -hmm.